Okay. How's that? Very good. Oh, maybe we're getting some feedback there. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, once again, I want to thank all of you for those very generous and kind comments you made in the Christmas cards you gave my wife and I last week. And thank you for your generous gift as well. It's much appreciated. Uh, I think this is the 45th year I've been teaching this class, so... Uh, and uh, you know what Mark is saying about this class, uh, things are going to improve here. And I've been talking with the pastors here. What they really are wanting, and I think I would agree, and hopefully you would agree too, is to have the class changed in such a way that what you're going to be hearing from me and other scholars of reasons to believe are short series of talks. It's what I do when I travel outside of the, this uh, area, uh, when I'm speaking on seminary campuses. They have me give a series of talks, and the way it works is I speak for 30 minutes, and we have 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so the church is asking that we segue this class into that kind of a format, where there be a speaker that would speak for 30 minutes uninterrupted, and then we open it up for Q&A uh, from both the class and, of course, from those that are participating through live streaming on the internet. And we would record these and they would go up on the internet and be permanently uh, in, uh, preserved there. And we'd also engage people to ask questions on the recorded talks. And we're looking at having series that would be as short as two Sundays and as long as eight, nothing longer than eight. And it would be, in each case, a set of new talks that have not been presented before. And we'd be packaged, and the whole idea is we'd create a library of these recorded video talks uh, that would grow over time. And they've also asked that uh, we, and I have not really been promoting this class uh, through reasons to believe in our social media platforms. Uh, they've asked us to wait until we get this room set, because the idea is we want to have good sound quality, good lighting, uh, where we can actually have uh, questions easily heard from people in the audience, as well as those that are communicating through the internet. So uh, the improvements that Mark is talking about have significance for what's going to be happening in this class in terms of the, the teaching style, the teaching content. And also, I've lined up a number of the reasons to believe scholars to come here and do short series. And that'll particularly help when I'm having to travel out of town. So that's what's in the offing, and uh, we're hoping we can actually have this all set in place within six months. That's the goal. And so you're going to see some changes taking place here. And uh, once uh, this room is set, uh, then we're going to work hard to fill this place up. We're actually thinking of taking down that barrier to make this class larger. And uh, there's also talk about having us uh, gather round tables which means you can actually eat while you're hearing the speaker and uh, have your computers there so that uh, if you want to uh, 
uh, check things out on the internet while you're hearing the talk and ask questions that way uh, to make all that possible. I've actually been doing this in other churches across the country and it's a format that works well. Uh, and people are more engaged when they come with their food and their computers. So that's what's going to be happening. Um, and what's going to be happening today, I'm going to talk to you first about a discovery that got announced at the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco a few days ago, a major breakthrough. And then we'll segue from there to our study on Isaiah and what the book of Isaiah has got to say about the second rebirth of Israel as a nation. And I didn't bring handouts with me. That's because we have Colleen at the back there. She's got stacks of all the handouts. And they're also up on the internet. You go to paradoxes.org. Uh, you can access them there. And uh, again, the way this class works, I'll take questions at any time, both from you that are here in person and for those of you that are watching and listening over the internet, uh, we take questions from you too. So if you've got a question, uh, if you're one of the virtual participants here, uh, simply uh, uh, text that in. Is that how it works, where they just kind of write the question in? Okay, you can write, write it in, we'll see it, and uh, we'll answer it as it comes in. Okay, one of the latest vacation destinations is a place called Ishua. And uh, this little map of uh, southern Greenland shows you where this incredible vacation site is. Uh, they actually have daily flights into the capital city of uh, Greenland, uh, Newark. And just north of there is this amazing vacation destination. Okay, why do people want to go to Ishua? By the way, how many have ever heard of Ishua? Probably, oh, some of you have. Good, glad to hear about it. Okay, Ishua has become a vacation destination because it's the one place where we actually have the Earth's first rocks. So the oldest rocks in the world are in this place called Ishua, at least the oldest stable rocks in the world, rocks that have remained there uh, since they were formed. And so people actually take flights into Newark and uh, then they uh, take uh, an interesting road uh, up to this place, Ishua, where they get to see the oldest rocks on the face of the Earth. And here's actually a little photo of one region where we see these incredibly old rocks. You say, how old are they? The oldest ones they've found date to 3.825 billion years ago. Now, uh, this is the time in Earth's history where we get the first stable rocks and the first stable liquid water. Previous to 3.825 billion years ago, uh, the Earth was hot. In fact, they refer to the era before 3.8 billion as the Hadean era, namely the era when the surface of the Earth was hellishly hot. Now, what we do know from some zircons that have been discovered, there were brief episodes previous to 3.8 billion years uh, where rocks could form and liquid water could appear, but it was very temporary. The hellish conditions would return, and then uh, the liquid water would disappear, and uh, the zircons are really, zircons are minerals that are very heat resistant. And so we do have some zircons that survived previous to 3.8 billion years ago, and they tell us there was these very brief moments in the history of the Earth previous to 3.8 billion years where there were actually conditions cool enough that liquid water can form, but it was temporary. What we see here in Ishua is a place where you get the first permanent rocks and the first permanent liquid water appearing on the face of the earth. And so people flock to this place uh, in order to see these oldest rocks. Another reason why they flock there is to find the site of the first life on planet earth. And so this little rock exposure here uh, in the Ishua area is a place where we find not only the oldest rocks, but the oldest isotope evidence for life. Uh, there are no fossils that date back that early, but they do note that life, for example, has a preference for carbon-12 compared to carbon-13. So, for example, when you consume your food, uh, your body works in such a way that it selects the carbon-12 
against the carbon-13. That's true of all life forms. And likewise, uh, our biology prefers nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-15, and we like sulfur-32 better than we like sulfur-34. And so what they've done in Ishua is actually pulled out these carbonaceous minerals and they look for the isotope ratios, a carbon-12 to carbon-13, nitrogen-14 to nitrogen-15, sulfur-32 to sulfur-34, and lo and behold what they find in these oldest rocks on the face of the earth, we see the isotope signatures for life, basically establishing that life shows up at the same time stable rocks first appear and stable liquid water first appears. And uh, Niles Eldridge, how many of you have ever heard of Niles Eldridge? Niles Eldridge, along with Stephen Gould, uh, launched a new model, uh, the punctuated evolution model for the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, both of them are atheists. Uh, Stephen Gould has passed away. I think Niles has just passed away recently as well. But uh, he wrote this in his book, the triumph of evolution, the failure of creationism. He was an anti-creationist, a very ardent evolutionist, and uh, I've got his book, and uh, you know, the tone of the book uh, is quite severe on just how crazy these creationists are and how smart and wise the atheistic evolutionists are. But this is what he wrote on page 35 and 36 of this uh, triumphal book that he wrote. He says, one of the most arresting facts that I've ever learned is that in the very oldest rocks that stand a chance of showing the signs of life, we find these signs. So here he is as an atheist looking at these oldest rocks and saying, how astounding it is that the very oldest rocks, uh, the very first opportunity we ever have to see life, life is there. And his response is, life is intrinsic to the earth. In other words, he was speculating there must be something hidden in the physics that means the moment that uh, life is possible, we instantly get life. But that's the evidence. Here we see the oldest rocks on the face of the earth, and in those oldest rocks, we see the signs that life is there. Okay, this is background for what was announced at the American Geophysical Union fall meeting a few days ago in San Francisco. And uh, there was a geophysicist that stood up and delivered a paper, and uh, her name was uh, Claire Nichols, and uh, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she says, she's reporting on how she and her team went to Ishua, and what they were looking for uh, was the signs of Earth's magnetic field. And everybody thought there's no way they're going to be able to find these signs because uh, the rocks that we see at Ishua uh, have experienced severe pressure and heat. And it's basically metamorphic rock, and uh, therefore it's been uh, crushed by the heat and the pressure of Earth's interior, and when that happens, you lose the magnetic field. However, she and her team found in the very northernmost region of Ishua, so if I were to go back to this uh, map here, they went to Ishua, but they went to the northernmost part that they issue a green belt area, and there they found rocks uh, that had experienced the least amount of pressure and heat uh, from the Earth's past geology, and they found minerals in those rocks, um, you know, ferrous minerals, that actually showed they were all aligned in a particular direction, basically indicating that they were aligned by the early magnetic field of the Earth. And so they were able to announce at the San Francisco meeting that uh, we were able to push back the date for the earliest evidence of the uh, Earth's magnetic field uh, by more than 200 million years. The earliest evidence we had before that was in South Africa, uh, where they found rocks and they found iron ferrous minerals there uh, that were aligned demonstrating the Earth's magnetic field dated back to a little bit less than 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, this discovery that was announced in San Francisco uh, pushes it back earlier than 3.7 billion years. That's the date they had on the rocks in which these minerals were found. And uh, they're continuing to do research there. 
uh, with the goal of being able to push it back uh, to 3.8 uh, billion years. But basically the news that was announced is Earth's magnetic field uh, is a good 200, 250 million years older than what we thought previously. And it could extend back earlier, we don't know. And uh, there were several scientists who spoke at that San Francisco meeting and said, well, you know, this makes reasonable sense because if the Earth didn't have a magnetic field uh, 3.8 billion years ago, uh, then uh, the radiation from cosmic rays and uh, solar flares, and keep in mind solar flaring was much more intense back then than it is now by a good 10,000 times. Not a good time to be a human being back then, but if you're a bacteria, you can handle all that radiation. But that radiation uh, would be sputtering away Earth's atmosphere, and it would cause water uh, from the surface of the Earth uh, to be dissipated into outer space. And we got good evidence that didn't happen. So a number of scientists says, well, it's great that you got these measurements to prove that the magnetic field dates earlier than 3.7 billion years ago, but we already had a good hunch that that had to be because we got evidence that water was not leaving the Earth at a rapid rate and the atmosphere wasn't being sputtered away. And moreover, that would be crucial for life to be able to exist even in its most primitive form 3.8 billion years ago. But the, the geophysicists at this meeting were rather excited because this is all coming together into a nice, consistent picture. We have a question at the back. Yeah, a quick question. I don't know if it's a stupid question or not, but are magnetism and gravity linked together in any way? Um, electromagnetic energy and gravitational energy are distinct today. If you go back in the very early history of the Earth, they were united as a single force. I mean, you've probably heard of the unified field theory, and that's based on the idea uh, with Big Bang cosmology, the universe starts off extremely hot and gets colder and colder as it expands. And there was a time when the universe was so hot, all four forces of physics uh, were united into a single force. But as the universe cooled, Gravity separated out, later the strong nuclear force separated out, later the weak nuclear force separated out, the last force to separate out was electromagnetism. But it's such today that electromagnetic uh, the force operates in a way that's independent from the gravitational force. Now what you do see with magnetism, if you've got a rock that shows magnetic alignment, or all the ferrous minerals all aligned together, if you heat it up enough, the magnetism uh, disappears, apparently disappears. If you cool it the right way, you can see the heat energy and the magnetic energy uh, separating out. Okay, was there a follow-up? Yeah. Oh, since day one of the Earth, not, I shouldn't say that, it sounds like I'm talking about Genesis. <laughs> but since the beginning of Earth, it, they, they've been separate forces completely, right? Yes. I mean, the only time they're united is when the Earth universe is younger than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And yeah, the Earth formed a lot later than that. So uh, given the late date for the formation of the Earth, the four forces of physics were distinct forces relative to one another. Okay. So uh, let me pull us back here. This is the Niles Eldridge quote. And uh, so the magnetic field literally has been intact, provably back to 3.7 billion years by direct measurements. And by the fact that life was there 3.825 billion years ago, uh, then uh, we know from indirect ways uh, that the field was intact back to the very beginning of life itself. And this is what the magnetic field looks like in the near vicinity of the Earth. And uh, so we do see a stronger uh, concentration of magnetic field lines at what's called the North Magnetic Pole. And actually, this is fairly accurate today. Those of you that are older can remember a time when the North Magnetic Field Pole uh, was quite a bit off from the uh, rotational pole of the Earth. Today, they're not that far apart which means if you've got a compass, 
it's a much more accurate pointer to true north than it was, say, 50 years ago. Uh, I think the magnetic pole right now is less than 300 miles away from the uh, north pole of the rotation axis of the Earth. And this is what the magnetic field looks like in terms of uh, getting reasonably far away from the Earth. Uh, you can see that uh, because of the solar wind, uh, it gets distorted both in the uh, part of the Earth that faces the Sun and part of the Earth that's away uh, from the Sun. Uh, but evidently, this magnetic field's been intact uh, back to 3.8 billion years ago. And again, uh, we now have evidence uh, that um, the tectonic activity of the Earth, although not plate tectonics, but tectonic activity actually was initiated at about the same time as the origin of life. In fact, what you'll see in my book, Improbable Planet, uh, for tectonics uh, to work well, you need uh, photosynthetic life uh, bringing uranium precipitates into the regions between the different plates of the Earth and that the tectonic activity actually plays a, role, plays a role in recycling the nutrients which allows life to be sustained. Because that's part of the evidence that we see is that from 3.825 billion years ago to the present day, life has continuously remained upon the face of the Earth. For that to be possible, you need tectonic activity continuously operating and you also need a strong magnetic field to be continuously operating. But thanks to what was announced at the American Geophysical Union, we now have actual measurements that establish that indeed is the case. We got a question over here. Yeah, wait for the microphone so the people on the internet can hear too. I was just wondering, is there any other planets, our galaxy or other galaxies that they've observed to have that same kind of like magnetic property that will allow water to remain on the Earth and not dissipate and stuff like that? Okay, what we are seeing is uh, Jupiter, for example, has a strong magnetic field. And uh, that a planet that large uh, has a fairly high probability of having a magnetic field. Uh, we don't see any evidence of tectonic activity on Jupiter, however. But we do see evidence for this magnetic field. The remarkable thing is that we've got a planet as small as Earth with a strong magnetic field. That's what's really uh, astounding. And uh, I've written articles on the internet in my uh, weekly blog called Today's New Reason to Believe, uh, basically talking about new research findings that strongly indicate uh, that Earth is probably the only planet uh, that is able to have a strong magnetic field, long-lasting plate tectonic activity on a planet that has the possibility to sustain life. I mean, we can think of other planets that have those characteristics of a magnetic field and, and tectonics, but they would not be able to sustain life. We, so, but, so our planet is a small planet. Matter of fact, there's a couple of research papers that have been published saying if you've got a planet more massive than the Earth, uh, the plate tectonic activity and the magnetic field will be more short-lived than it is on Earth. And if you've got a planet smaller than the Earth, Likewise, it's going to be more short-lived uh, than it otherwise would be. So we, we have the optimal mass uh, to have the longest-lasting magnetic field and the longest-lasting tectonic activity. However, we've been finding planets about the mass of the Earth that don't have these properties. And so what we now recognize is that it's because of the unusual composition of the Earth. I mean, the rule of thumb for planet formation is the closer the planet is to its host star, the denser it will be. And of the eight planets in our solar system, every one of them fits that rule except planet Earth. Planet Earth is the exception. So for example, Mercury is denser than Venus. And Venus is denser than Mars. But Earth is denser than Mercury. And the reason why Earth, Earth is the densest body in the solar system, and the reason why it doesn't follow the rule for planet formation is that planet Earth uh, received a collision from another planet. I mean, there are eight planets in the solar system today, but when our solar system was first formed, there were 10 planets. 
Okay, one was a gas giant, uh, a good ten times more massive than the Earth, that either got kicked out of the solar system uh, or thrown out about 50 times more distant uh, from the sun than uh, Neptune is today. And uh, that was crucial in order to get the gas giant planets to be the right distance so that life would be possible here on planet Earth. Uh, but the tenth planet was a planet called Thea uh, that was in an orbit very close to that of the Earth and the two planets had a merger event. And the merger event caused the heavy material from Thea to be injected into the primordial Earth and the light material ejected out, much of which formed the moon. So the moon formed as a result of these two planets having a reasonably soft uh, collision event uh, shortly after the Earth was formed. And that's one of several reasons why Earth is so exceptional and that it's a small rocky planet that's incredibly dense. And it's because of that great density that there's a lot of uranium and thorium in the core of the Earth which provides the heat to have not only a solid metal core of iron, cobalt, and nickel, but outside that solid core to have a liquid core of cobalt, nickel, and iron. And cobalt, nickel, and iron uh, are ferrous metals, which means they can be magnetized. And it's all that sloshing magnetic uh, minerals or uh, elements moving around the uh, solid outer core that's responsible for the magnetic field and see heat pouring out from the decay of uranium and thorium uh, that uh, explains uh, the energy that generates the plate tectonic activity. But yeah, I've written blog articles and you'll actually see some material in Improbable Planet making the point uh, that this is, requires such extraordinary fine tuning. Earth likely is the only planet that exists uh, that has billions of years of a strong magnetic field and billions of years of tectonic activity that makes possible billions of years of history of life. And so a lot of my astronomer peers will say maybe we can find a planet that has life on it, but it's not going to be life that lasts for 3.8 billion years. It's going to be short-lived, in which case it's going to be primitive life. It will not be advanced life. In fact, in the last 18 months, several papers have been published saying we need to recognize the fact that we are the only planet in the universe that has intelligent life on it because this is the only planet that has a long enough history of life continuously existing on it uh, where you could get the possibility of advanced life. There's a reason why we show up last. It takes a lot of preparation of billions of years of life before us to get the planet in a condition that can support human beings. So yeah, if you haven't heard this, you're all at the end of the line. Uh, we're at the uh, near the end when life will be possible on planet Earth, but there's a blessing in all of that. That means we have, thanks to previous life on planet Earth, all the endowments that we need uh, to make possible our global civilization. There was a question in the back. Yes. If I have a compass and I go to the southern hemisphere, will the needle point to the to the south? The needle will point to the south, yes. And if I'm at the equator, what happens? It will still point to the south or the north. Because after all, your compass uh, has a needle on it, right? And uh, what happens is that one end of the needle points to the north, the other end of the needle points to the south. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it just flips around. No matter where you are, it's going to point to the north. And uh, thanks to living in 2020, almost 2020, uh, your compass all points almost exactly towards true north. So yeah, the North Star is a great place to figure out where the north is, but now your compass is almost as good as the North Star. North Star gets you to less than a degree away from true north, and uh, your compass gets you to within a couple of degrees of true north. So, any more questions? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Get the microphone over there. Doctor, I don't uh, <coughs> understand why a scientist will see all this uh, miraculous uh, actions from a designer, intelligent design, 
And I believe that this is from a uh, deity. I, I don't see why they don't see that. Any reasons for it? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're human beings, and we're all born in rebellion against God. I mean, it tells us in Romans 1 that, uh, you know, people have the evidence before them. We all have the book of nature, which is why it tells us in Romans 1 that we're all without excuse. We can't say we didn't have the evidence. God has clearly revealed himself. But what people do, according to Romans 1, they engage in self-imposed ignorance. They know the truth, and they blind their eyes to the truth. I mean, what I see with atheist research scientists, I mean, Niles Eldridge here is just one example I picked out. Uh, they all get together and say, well, what do we really know for certain? Well, one of the things we know for certain is there can't possibly be a God. And since there can't possibly be a God, we have to somehow interpret everything we're learning in nature in that context, which explains why Niles Eldridge, rather than drawing the conclusion, hey, we're seeing the instantaneous appearance of life. If life appears instantaneously, that means there's got to be some kind of cosmic engineer that's making it on the spot. But rather than drawing that conclusion, he said, life is intrinsic to the earth. In other words, there must be something in the physics and the chemistry that we're not able to discern that explains how life can spontaneously and instantly appear uh, without any supernatural agency. The problem is, if there was something in the physics and chemistry, how could we possibly not see it? And actually what now Zeldridge is doing was borrowing uh, from what was published by the Santa Fe Institute decades ago. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the founder of this uh, Santa Fe Institute, uh, the scientist uh, Stuart Kaufman, he gave a lecture at Caltech several decades ago and basically told all of his evolutionist friends here this model of Darwinian and neo-Darwinian evolution where we get mutations and natural selection and gene exchange he gave a brilliant lecture on why that can't possibly explain what we see going on in the fossil record. But he says, I'm not a creationist. I believe that there's a fourth law of thermodynamics that explains how all this happened. And what he meant by a fourth law of thermodynamics, he says, you know, thermodynamics tells us that everything decays if you wait long enough. Matter of fact, you usually don't, usually don't have to wait very long before you see the decay. Uh, you know, entropy, everything is undergoing decay. But uh, he was speculating that the way we can explain the origin of life and the advance of life is that there are regions in the universe where instead of thermodynamics running the way we see, it runs the opposite way. So instead of things becoming more disorganized and more decayed, they become more organized where the information content increases with respect to time and he says, that explains the origin of life. That explains how we start with primitive life and get complex life. There's these brief episodes in, in these regions, small regions of the universe, where thermodynamics goes the opposite way. Now, I've written about this in my book, The Crater and the Cosmos, saying one of the things we know as a requirement for life is that the universe has to be homogeneous and uniform on large scales. And, uh, you know, therefore, if this fourth law of thermodynamics is operating in such a way and a level to explain the origin and history of life, uh, then life would not even be possible because of the requirement for homogeneity and uniformity. Now, now Zeld, or pardon me, Stuart Kaufman, a response, and he says, I'm talking about very tiny regions and very brief moments. However, one of the things we learn about thermodynamics is, yes, Thermodynamics actually does allow for things to go the opposite way, providing the rest of the universe goes much more beyond the normal way of decay. In other words, it's the average amount of decay that counts in terms of thermodynamics. So, for example, if you've got a region of the Earth where things are decaying much more rapidly than normal, that would allow to have a small region of the universe decay at a less rapid rate. I mean, take all of us in this room, for example. We're all decaying, but we're decaying at different rates. Uh, but if you average out the decay, it obeys the second law of thermodynamics. 
But here's the problem, if you're trying to explain something like the origin of life. Yes, you can get a departure from thermodynamic equilibrium in a very tiny window of time in a very small region of the universe, but the laws of thermodynamics tell us it must return to thermodynamic equilibrium um, at a rate that is uh, inversely proportional to how far you depart from thermodynamic equilibrium. In other words, the greater the departure from thermodynamic equilibrium, the faster it must return. And for something like the origin of life, uh, the snapback time is less than a second. And life has been here for 3.8 billion years. So, um, but hey, you can read the creator and the cosmos uh, for the response, but uh, this, is, this is an example of what you're talking about, yes. The rational conclusion is we need someone supernatural intervene. I mean, my colleague Fazrana says, and he's had great success talking to university audiences, scientists with us saying, just look at the analogy, okay? When we see something instantaneous and complex appearing, it's because there's been a human engineer that's intervened. And if you get enough engineers or you get people with enough intellect, enough technology, they can do it more rapidly than if you only have one or two engineers with not much money and technology. But he says, when we look at the origin of life, the evidence tells us it's instantaneous and the result we get is complex. It's not just one bacterium at a very primitive level. We see a whole ecology of bacteria. And we even see photosynthetic bacteria, the most complex of the microorganism life forms. They show up there at the beginning and therefore he says, this testifies of a super engineer. <coughs> and just using the analogies we see in human engineering, based on the complexity of what's been created, you get some idea of the money behind the engineers, how many engineers are involved, and how skilled and knowledgeable and brilliant they are. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, your uh, explanation about the average uh, the average entropy of the universe increasing and uh, that small pockets could be uh, causing the reverse of that as long as the average comes out kind of sounds to me like there's little bubbles of independent space that have these properties but the fact is life itself is provides that opportunity because just the process of metabolism and and growth of, of, of human or any other kind of life is a decreasing of entropy, an increasing of order right. that is balanced out within that body by the uh, production, production of waste products that have a more disordered state than the increase of order in the life itself. So that's happening all around in life, and it's just one of the amazing things about life that it has that property of being able to consistently decrease entropy locally at the same place in the same time that it's, um, it's providing that balance to, uh, to provide a greater uh, decrease or increase in entropy throughout the whole body as well. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, this treat table is a good example of that, right? We consume these treats and as they go through our bodies, they become more disorganized than what they were out there by a considerable degree. And by that process, our human body is able to depart from thermodynamic equilibrium. Every organism is a departure from thermodynamic equilibrium. But it's able to do that by increasing entropy outside. So all of us are making the universe uh, more decayed than it otherwise would be. So just, that's something you can share with your children and grandchildren, right? The very fact that you're alive uh, means that you're actually making the universe more disorganized than another would be. Why? Because your very existence as a living being requires that you depart from thermodynamic equilibrium. But what happens when you die? All that stops and everything just flows according. So that's one of the ways we can tell if, some, if a creature is alive. A cre if a creature is experiencing a greater rate of decay than people are alive, we, then we question whether they really are alive. And uh, medical people are very good at doing that. So, uh, but you know, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and the reason why that works with organisms, we have machines. Machines are basically devices 
that take energy from the world and make it more disorganized in order to be able to perform work. And so every living organism is basically a set of machines uh, that's engineered in such a way as to make the system outside the organism more disorganized so we can perform work. So yeah, uh, people say, I wish we didn't live in a universe with all this decay, but it wasn't for all the decay, you wouldn't be able to work, you wouldn't be able to live, at least given the laws of physics that we have. Okay, we're done with that. Let's see if we can jump into our study in Isaiah and the little segment that we're on right now. If you didn't get the handout, uh, it's there at the back. We're currently going through this set of scripture passages, heavily uh, citing the book of Isaiah. But what we've done here is actually given you a complete list of scriptures in the entire Bible that deal with what Isaiah talks about in part about the second rebirth of Israel as a nation. And uh, last Sunday, we talked about, let me move through here, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Virtually the entire chapter is loaded with details about what would happen uh, when this nation of Israel is born for a second time. So yeah, the nation of Israel was formed, uh, by uh, Joshua and came to its peak in the days of uh, King David and uh, uh, his son Solomon. And as we see predicted uh, by Moses at the end of Deuteronomy, he says the nation will form, but when the nation reaches its peak of prosperity, uh, you, the Jews, will begin to go spiritually astray. And you'll go spiritually astray to such a degree that God's going to have to bring judgment upon you and you'll be cast out of the land. Uh, you'll be taken to a different country. Uh, but God will have favor upon you when you repent. And the nation will form again. And uh, all that, uh, as, as Moses predicted, was actually fulfilled. Uh, you also got that same statement by the prophet uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel was part of the first uh, dispersal of the Jews out of the land of Israel, uh, where he was taken as a prisoner, as a captive to uh, uh, Babylon, uh, but it was of such outstanding capability, he became the prime minister of the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but there he wrote a book, the book of Daniel, where he said, a time will come when God will bring us back into the land. Matter of fact, it was Jeremiah who predicted that it would be a period of 70 years. They would be captive, in the land of Babylon for 70 years, but God would return them. And if you read Daniel chapter 9 and 10, it's basically Daniel praying to God saying, uh, you said 70 years. And he was basically calling upon God in prayer, okay, the 70 years are almost up. Uh, let's uh, get us back into the land. And uh, it was the Persian Empire uh, that uh, basically issued a decree uh, where the captives could go back and rebuild their nation. So that's the first rebirth of Israel as a nation. Uh, but we see in Deuteronomy 28, as well as in the book of Daniel, uh, that God would judge them a second time. And uh, specifically, that uh, they would be uh, judged by a nation to the west, a reference to the Roman Empire. They would come in and to put an end to the uh, Jewish nation. And this time they would gather up all the Jews and have them sent to Egypt where they'd be sold as slaves throughout the whole world. And it's in the book of uh, Deuteronomy 28 uh, where Moses says this time it's not just going to be 70 years. You're going to be spread throughout the nations of the world for many, many generations. And you'll, as you're spread there you're going to be persecuted and uh, you're going to be going from place to place. You're not going to find a place where you can set up a permanent uh, habitation. Uh, and uh, the land will be cursed while you're gone. And so referring to the land of uh, Israel, uh, during the diaspora, the dispersal of the Jews to all the nations of the world, uh, the nation or the territory of Israel would become ruined and desolate and barren. But then... We see uh, Moses and other prophets basically saying, a time will come when God will take you 
out of this long period of being dispersed amongst the nations and bring you back into the land. And that's a reference to the second rebirth of Israel. And last week I told you about uh, Jeremiah 31 predicting that in the days of the second rebirth of Israel as a nation, the city of Jerusalem will expand. And what we see here, I, I didn't have a map for you last week, so I prepared this for you for this time. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the old city of Jerusalem. It's about one square mile and uh, basically shows you uh, the old city walls uh, that were built there. And uh, this is how Jerusalem looked uh, since 70 AD all the way forward uh, to uh, the present time. So it shows you the old city walls out there. And up until 19, or from 1885, this was the limit of the extent of the city of Jerusalem. And so for nearly 2,000 years, uh, it stayed as this one small area. In fact, it goes back earlier than that. Uh, you go all the way back to uh, King Solomon's time. This is the extent of the city of Jerusalem. But it was Jeremiah, the end of Jeremiah 31 says, at the time of the second return, of uh, second rebirth of uh, Israel as a nation, the city would expand and nine suburbs would be built outside the old city walls. And I didn't have you a map before. I've actually got a map at uh, home that shows the detailed boundaries of the uh, uh, nine suburbs that were built uh, post 1885. Um, you'll have to do with this. I didn't have time to draw the exact boundaries out. Kind of hard to do on a, on a keynote presentation. But these are the central locations of the uh, nine suburbs. So what we see here is the first suburb was built just outside the north uh, wall, uh, basically in between the, uh, the very middle part of the north wall. That was suburb one and it began to be settled. What happened in 1885 is Jews from all over the world slowly began to return to the land of Israel. And there wasn't enough room inside the old city walls. And actually, if I go back to this map here, it was partitioned into four pieces. Uh, you had uh, a neighborhood for the Muslims, a neighborhood for the Christians, a neighborhood for the Armenians, and a neighborhood for the Jews. And the neighborhood for the Jews was the smallest. If I were to go over here, uh, basically this central south region, uh, that was the Jewish quarter. Uh, over here we got the Armenian quarter, and above the Armenian quarter, you've got the Christian quarter, and the biggest quarter of all was the Muslim quarter uh, to the north and central part. But the Jewish quarter was the smallest of the four quarters. And uh, there was no way they were going to be able to push out uh, the uh, Muslims or the Christians or the Armenians. And so beginning in 1885, they said, we're going to have to form a community uh, outside uh, the city walls. And so the first one they formed was the one labeled number one. And over the course of about uh, 35 years, uh, it uh, uh, grew and expanded. And, uh, and then after that, there wasn't enough room uh, for the Jews are returning. And so the second suburb was built at the northwest part of the old city walls. And so suburbs one and two were the first suburbs. Notice they're just adjacent to the north side of the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, but as we move into the 20th century, starting in about 2010, 2015, suburb number three was built. And then later on, in the 30s and 40s, suburb four was built. And what you see is the suburbs basically began to move outside the north wall and began to extend towards the west. The interesting thing geographically about suburbs, uh, spe especially three and four, is that uh, they're not really good places to build homes. But there's a high ridge that runs off uh, from suburb two out to three and four kind of a high, narrow ridge, and uh, it was easily defended. Because this is a time when the Muslims in the area were concerned 
about all these returning Jews and felt threatened by them and were actually trying to prevent uh, Jews from settling. And so the Jews that did settle said, we're going to have to build the suburb in a place where we can defend ourselves. So they purposely picked this long, high ridge in which to build. Made it very difficult to put homes and buildings there because of the terrain, uh, but it was the most secure place in terms of defense. And uh, then as the numbers of Jews began to increase uh, beyond 200,000, you know, started off with uh, just 30,000 and then it began to build up to about uh, two and 300,000 by the late 1930s. And that's when they began to think about uh, building suburbs five and six. <coughs> and five and six and seven, or five and six were the suburbs that were built uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, and early 1960s. Uh, today, there's over a million people living in uh, Jerusalem. So it went from having about 20,000 people inside the old city walls uh, to having a few tens of thousands of Jews outside the city walls. Uh, today, there's over a million people uh, living uh, in the suburbs outside the old city walls. Now, <coughs> five and six were not built until uh, Israel was founded as a nation in 1948. And what happened in 1948 is that the settlement region uh, for the Jews began to expand. So here actually shows a 1948 map of uh, uh, Israel uh, after the War of Independence in 1948. And uh, this was a significant expansion of the area that was occupied by the Jews previous to 1948. And uh, what you notice there is that uh, there is a region. Let me kind of zoom in on this a little bit. There's a region there uh, where you see Jerusalem. And actually what happened, as I mentioned last week, is that in the War of Independence, uh, there were two, a little more than uh, uh, 2,000 uh, people who had been released from Hitler's death camps. And uh, they came into Tel Aviv, and uh, David Ben-Gurion uh, formed them into two battalions and charged them with the job of opening up a corridor to Jerusalem. You know, throughout the 1948 War of Independence, uh, the Arabs had cut a link uh, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And uh, it was David Ben-Gurion who recognized we really can't have a Jewish nation if there is no link between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And he actually had four different military campaigns to open up that link, and all four failed. The last one was where he sent in these two battalions of uh, people who had escaped Hitler's death camps and uh, they fought a very bloody battle, but they were successful in opening up a route uh, between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And this actually pushed back the region where now uh, suburbs five and six could be built. So five and six were under Arab control before 1948. After 1948, they were under uh, Jewish control and therefore those suburbs could now be built. Uh, just north of suburbs four and three. Seven, eight, and nine, those sites until 1967 uh, were under uh, the control of the nation of Jordan. So if I were to go back to this map here, you'll see that uh, suburbs, the locations of suburbs seven, eight, and nine outside the city of Jerusalem were under the control of Jordan and therefore there was no possibility of Jews settling in those regions. It had to wait until after the 67 war uh, where the Jews got control of the West Bank uh, region. <coughs> now, if I go back to this, what's remarkable about the prophecy in Jeremiah 31 is that if there was no military reasons, then you'd expect suburbs 9, 8, and 7 to be built first because this is a region where you've got nice flat land where it's well watered. Uh, this would be the easiest place to have set up buildings and homes. Uh, suburb sites uh, 2, 3, and 4 are the worst sites geographically for building suburbs. Uh, but what we see is it happened in the opposite direction. Today we can understand from a military perspective 
why the order of the building of the suburbs is completely backwards to what you'd expect if your goal was to actually start expanding the city outside the old city walls. But I think that's what makes the prophecy in Jeremiah so remarkable. Uh, it was written 2,700 years ago, uh, predicted that this is how the expansion outside the old city walls would work, and it's actually counter to logic and reason if you don't take into account the military exigencies that uh, force these suburbs to be built in the opposite direction that you'd expect. Okay, <coughs> we ended last Sunday uh, with the prophecy in Ezekiel 36 about what would happen when the nation was formed and basically made the point that uh, when the nation is formed for a second time, <coughs> the people of Edom, Ammon, and Moab uh, would come in and take the ancient high places of worship. And basically see in Ezekiel 36 is God saying to the people of Edom, you've come in to steal, to take away uh, what I have promised uh, to my people of Israel. And uh, with glee you came in and took control of this territory and made it your own. And if actually if you look at the War of Independence, uh, Jordan had an army that was trained and equipped by the British. So it was the most advanced and best trained army uh, available to the Arab coalition that was trying to wipe out this new nation of Israel. And uh, they came into the West Bank uh, with the stated purpose, we're going to set up a Palestinian nation. We're not coming in here to steal. We're not coming in to expand our territory. We're coming in here to liberate the Palestinian people and set up a nation for them. And so they sent the uh, Arab Legion in from the nation of Jordan, invaded uh, the West Bank, took control of that area. But once they had control, they violated their promise. Instead of making this a homeland for the Palestinian Arabs that were living in the land of Israel, they made it part of their own nation, which explains a comment you see in Ezekiel 36. You came to steal and expand your territory. You made it your own. And indeed, the West Bank was part of the nation of Jordan until the war in 1967, the Six-Day War. But the interesting thing you see in Ezekiel 36 is a comment that they would come in and make this their own. They would steal this land, uh, but they would steal it in such a way that they would be in possession of all the ancient high places of worship. And um, this is not unique to me. A number of uh, Bible scholars have gone through the Old Testament and identified the 11 sites that were used uh, for worship uh, by uh, the Samaritans, uh, the people of Ephraim, and the people of Judah throughout the entire Old Testament time. And last Sunday I said, you know, I've got this map that shows the locations. I didn't have it ready for you. I got it ready for you this Sunday. Okay, those little green X's you see there, that represents all the locations you see in the Old Testament uh, where you got the uh, North Kingdom and the South Kingdom. Uh, those are the places uh, that they would conduct their worship. And what you notice is that uh, when Jordan came in in 1948 and took control of the West Bank and made a part of their nation, they happened to conquer all the places that are mentioned in the Old Testament as the ancient high places of worship. But Ezekiel 36 ends by saying, yes, you came, you took, and you steal, but my people, they will come, and they will take control over these ancient high places of worship. But the significant point here is that the prophecy is saying that when the nation is reformed for a second time, it will not have possession of any of the ancient high places of worship. But later, they will get control of these. And I can recall, uh, previous to the 1967 war, there were books and scholars saying, okay, we have this new nation of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel predicts that they will not have the ancient high places of worship, but later they will gain control. Something is going to happen whereby the Jews in Israel are going to get control over these ancient high places of worship. And then the shock of the Six-Day War in 1967, 
literally within less than 48 hours, uh, the Israelis were able to take control of all the ancient high places of worship. So, and what's interesting too is that uh, the Jews previous to 67 actually told the Jordanian king, the Egyptians are going to start a war with us. Please stay out of the war. We're not going to do anything to you. Uh, your country will be intact, your armed forces will be intact, and they begged them to stay out of the war. Um, but uh, they said, if you do decide to join with the Syrians and the Egyptians, we're going to be forced to act. And uh, that's what happened. Is that, uh, and the Jordanian king really regretted his decision to be aligned uh, with uh, uh, the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Iraqis uh, in trying to uh, you know, basically wipe Israel off the face of the earth. <coughs> and what the, the king didn't take into account, he moved his, and again, he had a very advanced army uh, that he moved in in the 67 war, uh, but because his air force had been completely destroyed within the first few hours of the 67 war, uh, the Israelis were able to use those aircraft basically to wipe out his entire army column that was advancing up from Jericho towards Jerusalem. And uh, the Jews or the Arabs were begging them, please send the army, we need to keep control over the old city of Jerusalem. But it didn't happen. And literally in less than 48 hours, uh, the Jews were able to take control of the entire West Bank. And this is what permitted uh, the building of these suburbs 7, 8, and 9. By the way, today, all nine suburbs are in place. Uh, the ninth suburb was the last suburb to be built, and uh, it was completed literally just a few years ago. And so now the city has over a million people. Yes? <clears throat> uh, I'm a little confused about the high places and, the, and the, the significance of the return of the high places uh, because it I've always considered, reading the Old Testament, that these high places were places that the uh, Israelites were kind of desecrating the name of the Lord, and they were doing yes. things they weren't supposed yes. to do. So why, why is it significant of getting these back? Well, <clears throat> you were on to something important, because there was only one high place uh, that had the endorsement of God which is basically Mount Moriah in the old city of Jerusalem. And if I can go back to this map of the city here, what you see here is the temple site over to the uh, east, and that's the highest part of the old city of Jerusalem. That's Mount Moriah, and God basically told King David that's the place. That's the one place and the only place uh, where you can come uh, to worship me. Uh, but once you had the northern kingdom separate from the southern kingdom, they said, you don't need to go to Mount Moriah. We're going to have our own places of worship. And so over the years, uh, we had all these different high places of worship. And by the way, it wasn't just in the northern kingdom that they set up these false places of high worship. It happened in the kingdom of Judah as well. People are saying, well, why should we make up this trip to Mount Moriah? Let's set up a place here in Hebron. And so, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Hebron, but it's kind of a high hill area. And uh, that's where people said, well, that's where Abraham was. They made that a high place of worship. So you can see here, uh, it wasn't just the North Kingdom, the South Kingdom did the same thing. But this is one of the reasons why God said, you're going to be cast out of the land. And so God had had it with these 10 other places of high places of worship where they were getting into pagan worship, and therefore he judged them and had them sent to the land of Babylon. But we see here in Ezekiel 36, it's basically a prophecy against the nation of Jordan, basically saying you're going to see a golden opportunity uh, to take advantage of the Jews who are fighting this coalition of eight Arab nations. You're going to have the most advanced army. You're going to come in, and you're going to come in with a promise, we're going to set up this Palestinian state, but in your greed, you're going to make it your own land. You're going to expand your border. You're going to take possession of these places, but I will set up my people against you, and eventually they'll wrest this land that you stole away. So, 
And it's interesting, the narrative you hear amongst Muslims today is that they say the Jews stole the land from us. But Ezekiel is basically saying, no, it was Jordan that came in and stole the land. And they stole the land with a false promise. But the 67 war basically gave control of the entire West Bank to the nation of Israel. And so that enabled all these new suburbs uh, to be built outside the old city walls. Yes. Uh, what's the likelihood that uh, Israel's going to annex it, the West Bank area? Is there some talk about that? Or? Well, actually, as we get into the next section, the development of the rebirth of the nation of Israel, there's actually Old Testament prophecies. In fact, we looked at a few of them last week. You repeatedly see in these passages I'm giving you references to Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Now, again, I should provide you a map with this. I can basically kind of show you is that uh, Edom is kind of in the south part of the nation of Jordan, and then you've got Ammon and Moab that go up to the north. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if you actually look at an Old Testament map of the territory of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, it's the same as the territory of Jordan if you take out the West Bank. And it was Winston Churchill who boasted, I created the nation of Transjordan with a stroke of a pen. But the stroke of his pen perfectly encompassed the ancient territories of Ammon, Moab, and Edom. So when you read in these uh, uh, verses I've given you, references to Ammon, Moab, and Edom, you can translate that to the modern nation of Jordan. But yes, uh, there are prophecies basically making the point, a day will come when the Jews in Israel will gain control of the territory of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, but they will not occupy it, but they'll gain control over it. And so what I've been speculating based on these passages, a time will come, and maybe something happens to the royal family of Jordan, uh, where now the nation is under threat, and somehow the Jews come in and rescue the nation of Jordan, and basically say, okay, this side of the Jordan River is yours. That'll be the side for the Arabs, the Palestinians, and the Muslims, and basically saying the West Bank will be ours. Because repeatedly we're running these passages where so many Jews will return to the land of Israel, uh, where the Jews who are returning are saying this land is too small. And basically, if you look, this is the 1948 border of the land. As probably many of you are aware, there's strong political um, uh, forces and nations outside of Israel saying we need to make this the permanent home of the Jews and the old Gaza Strip in the West Bank needs to be the permanent home of the Palestinians uh, but what's happening is so many Jews are returning there simply isn't room in the 1940 borders and basically what we see in these passages is that there'll be so many returning Jews that are saying you have to give us more room and evidently, when the Israelis gain control of the nation of Jordan, that will enable them to say, you know what, we're going to take the whole of the land of Palestine. That'll be the room, the place where you can settle 15 million Jews. Because right now, the Jewish population in Israel is standing north of 7 million. Half the Jews in the world are now living in the land of Israel. Uh, but as you're probably aware, a lot of them are living in suburbs that are part of the West Bank. But they've only occupied a tiny fraction of the West Bank. And again, there's pressure for them to withdraw to the old uh, 1948 borders. But hey, with all those Jews returning, where are you going to put them all? <clears throat> and so, and again, this is speculation. I'm not saying every Bible scholar agrees with this. But uh, this is, in other words, it's basically saying they'll gain control over Jordan, but they will not occupy it but evidently they will occupy the West Bank and now there'll be room for the 15 million Jews. Because what we do see in the next section, a time will come when all the Jews in the world will be living in the land of Israel. There's a whole lot of them living in New York and Los Angeles today, but something is gonna happen to motivate them to return. And what I find interesting, we actually do see right now um, emigration from New York and Los Angeles to uh, Israel. Why? Because of the economic advantages. Um, 
lot of high-tech companies are in Israel. I think I mentioned last week, uh, the United States has the most NASDAQ companies. Israel has the second largest number of NASDAQ countries. A nation of 7.5 million people ranks second on the NASDAQ stock exchange for listed companies. And it's because of those kinds of advantages, we're actually seeing an exodus from America of Jews to the land of Israel. Okay, got a couple of questions here. Uh, to segue, uh, there's good precedence, I think, and many others do, uh, for the West Bank to be under the control of Israel based upon not 1948 or uh, negotiations, but the League of Nations uh, in the 1920s uh, identified uh, Jordan as a land for Arab-Palestinian settlement. Right. Um, <clears throat> Jordan today do not want them. <laughs> Uh, there are too much problems. Uh, Jordan likes their economy stable. But based upon the League of Nations, uh, this area of the West Bank was called Transjordan. Uh, and there was no high division uh, among it, even in, as Transjordan. So I suggest that we revisit the League of Nations and the agreement that was uh, uh, originally made and, and uh, invite Jordan to, um, and Israel and others to honor that uh, uh, place for uh, Arab Palestinians to have a home. Well, that's, that's very wise. I mean, if you ever read the uh, uh, history of Winston Churchill, he was the one who was really pushing for that very thing. Uh, but what happened was there was such a strong anti-Semitic reaction in Britain and most of Europe at that time that uh, they basically caved in and said, okay, we're not going to make Palestine a Jewish nation only going to make part of Palestine a Jewish nation uh, because of the anti-Semitic uh, sentiment that was there. In fact, one of the things I admire about Winston Churchill, he remained a friend of the Jews in spite of the fact that all of his political contemporaries, virtually every one of them, was anti-Semitic. And uh, if you're probably aware of what happened after World War II, is that there was a lot of pressure uh, to allow Jews to return from the death camps uh, to the land of Israel, uh, but the British government wanting to try to maintain some sense of peace between the Arab Muslims and the Jews living there uh, basically stopped the immigration and began to have this plan of partition. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Originally, the Balfour Agreement uh, called for the whole of Palestine to be a Jewish uh, nation, and evidently, according to Ezekiel 36, that will happen in the future. So just like back before 1967, we could say something's going to happen whereby Israel will gain control of all these ancient high places. And uh, likewise, something's going to happen in the future whereby it's going to be possible for Jews to settle the entirety of the land of Palestine. And yes, you're right, Jordan does not want all these Palestinians. Uh, they would outnumber them. And they're concerned that uh, Jordan would no longer be a Hashemite uh, state, but would become a Palestinian state with all the unrest that brings. But evidently, something political is going to happen whereby that will change according to what we see prophesied 2,500 years ago. Now, to be very clear, what we see in Ezekiel 36, when the Jews gain control of these ancient high places of worship, they will not become places of worship. So what's going to happen is when the Jews take control of these ancient high places, they're going to become transformed from being barren highlands to becoming filled with trees. Basically mentions fruit trees and pine trees will flourish over all these high places. And now this is going to become an economically productive region. And what you see previous to 1967, these ancient high places were not productive at all. They were basically stripped barren hills Nothing was growing there. There was no economic uh, return to the people living there. It wasn't until the Jews took control of the West Bank that this now became a, a, a productive region. But I think that's interesting. Ezekiel's basically making the point these will not become places of worship, but they'll become places uh, where they will produce uh, fruit and wood and furniture uh, for the people that are living there, both uh, Arab Palestinians and for Jews. Also makes the point 
uh, that the non-Jews that are living there will work for the Jews and this whole region will become productive. So that's that part uh, right there. Now, <clears throat> got a question? Okay. Uh, as someone involved in science and you, you being a scientist, you might have special insight into this. Why do you think the, uh, um, there are so many Nobel Prizes that have been awarded to the, he, the Jewish people, uh, different ones? Well, uh, there is a selection effect that goes on when a people group experiences a severe persecution and does not assimilate. I mean, I can give you another example. The Armenians also have suffered a lot of persecution, not to the same degree as the Jews, but like the Jews, in spite of the severe persecution, the fact that they've been dispersed throughout the nations of the world, they've retained their ethnicity, their language, uh, their culture, uh, their religion. I mean, we see that right here in the LA area. There are huge Armenian communities here, but they maintain their culture, their language, and their religion. Uh, but what you see in any people group like that, that retains their ethnicity, doesn't become assimilated in the general population, yet experiences this kinds of intense persecution, there's a selection effect. The selection effect is uh, that it's the people who are the most accomplished, the most intelligent, uh, that have a higher probability of surviving under those conditions. They're also the people that are most likely to be involved in sustaining the language, the ethnicity, and the religion. And so it's not surprising that in the Jewish population uh, you have very high functioning members of the population, just like you do in the Armenian population. And so yes, the Jews as a people have a disproportionate number of Nobel Prizes, a hugely disproportionate number. And as I've already mentioned, they have a hugely disproportionate number of NASDAQ companies. And so, uh, and that's one reason why you actually see uh, anti-Semitism, is that uh, people are jealous of the accomplishment of these Jews, the achievements that they've been able to pull off, and uh, therefore in their jealousy, that tends to pour out in greater persecution. I think the same thing explains what happened to the Armenians. There was a jealousy amongst the Turks, for example, uh, that uh, was partly responsible for the genocide that took place. And so this is the amazing thing about the Jews and the Armenians. Both of them have suffered incredible persecution and genocide, and yet they've retained uh, their language, they've retained their ethnicity, and they've retained uh, their uh, religion. But the Jews to a much greater degree, because uh, they've they suffered to a far greater degree, and uh, therefore I think that explains the level of achievement. Explains, too, why this tiny nation of Israel has the highest percentage of physicists in the population, way more than any other nation in the world. And so the number of people with doctorates is way higher than anywhere else in the world. I mean, we've all heard those jokes about the Jewish mother, how she wants her sons to become doctors. Uh, but it's more pervasive than that. So, okay, but that's a good point. All right, we got a few minutes. No, we don't have a few minutes left. Um, Okay, where we ended up was Ezekiel 37, and uh, so I want us to pick up those passages next time we get together in the second rebirth of Israel as a nation. But what you're going to see as you move on from Ezekiel uh, into Hosea and uh, Zechariah and, uh, and the uh, yeah, Hosea passage, Amos passage, and on in the New Testament, it's basically going to talk about what's going to happen when the Jews begin to settle and how the nation will be transformed from being a very poor, I mean for years, literally centuries, the land of Palestine, the land of Israel was considered one of the poorest nations in the world and how it will be transformed into literally being the richest nation in the world. Now it talks about being the richest, I believe it's talking about being the richest on a per capita basis. So obviously their nation's bigger, that have greater total wealth, but we're going to see its predictions to the fact that a day will come when Israel will rank as the richest nation. And you say, how are we ever going to get Jews to leave Los Angeles and New York and Toronto and uh, go to Israel? Uh, I think the wealth and the technology is what's going to attract them to go there. 
Some people have speculated that maybe there's going to be anti-Semitism here in the U.S., uh, but hey, if there's a big enough wealth difference, uh, that may be sufficient to make it happen. And it says already we're seeing signs that Jews are leaving America and Canada and heading to Israel because of the economic advantages. And that's in spite of the fact that they have very high taxation. But that's something else we're going to look at as we move into the second section. Something's going to happen in the future to eliminate the tax burden upon the Israelis. Right now, they have a very high tax burden to maintain their military at a level sufficient uh, to ward off the threat of the Arab nations that are facing them. But a day will come when that tax burden will be lifted, and that's when you're really going to see the wealth of the nation just skyrocket. I mean, imagine what you could do if you didn't have to pay a cent in taxes. Ever thought about that? We're coming up to April. Uh, just think about what we could do. Uh, or think of what could happen if the United States, for example, didn't have $20 trillion of debt, uh, how different things would be. And isn't it remarkable, it was just a few years ago when our debt was really low. Matter of fact, when Israel was formed as a nation, we had a surplus. But things are going to happen that are going to transform uh, Israel's financial situation. And maybe that gives us some hope for our own situation. And hey, there's always an exhortation as we move into 2020 to plan our finances in such a way where we don't copy the example of our government. Okay, enough politics. I must, my promise is not to get political in this class. I made a mistake, I'm sorry. But the exhortation that we should all practice our finances in such a way uh, that are consistent with biblical principles. Father in heaven, we thank you that we are living at this remarkable time at the beginning of the 21st century. Lord, we can look into the scriptures and see that uh, what you wrote thousands of years ago is being fulfilled right before our eyes. And Father, I pray that we be able to use this as a tool to impress upon people that don't yet know you as creator, Lord, and Savior, to realize that you are a God that knows the future. You are a God that controls the future. And you've given us an ancient book that accurately predicts future events in our history and future scientific discoveries. Father, I pray that uh, we be able to use these insights, these prophecies, these statements in the Old and New Testament as a way to persuade people that this book we call the Bible is authoritative, it's inspired, uh, it's inerrant, and it's worth our attention and our time to study it and to see its message and its call upon us to get prepared for life in the new creation where we can be in a permanent loving relationship with you and with all of God's people there for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.